Okay, let's wrap this chapter up with a few um, kind of reminders and kind of uh, bringing together some conceptual type things. So the first thing we want to talk about here is what's called paired data. If you remember from before, um, we talked about matched pairs, a matched pairs um, experiment. This is uh, the same thing in an experiment in a study. It's just called paired data. But in an experiment, it would be called matched pairs. So I'm taking either two observations on the exact same individual, or I'm taking one observation on two very similar individuals. And what I can do with that information is that I can analyze the differences in each pair. Um, and so I can take, I'm using the same person, so or the same individuals, so that eliminates um, other variables and subjectivity, and then I can analyze the differences in each of those pairs. So I've basically run two tests on them. Okay? And if my conditions for inference are met when I do this, I can do what we call paired, what are sometimes called paired T procedures. Okay? Paired T procedures are just a, um, just a sample T procedure, okay? just um, your regular mean um, test but you're looking at the mean difference when you run the test. Instead of the mean of a particular sample, you've got, basically, you've got the two sets of data, the two conditions that you ran, the two tests that you ran on the same subject, and then you're looking at the difference between the two, and then you take that mean of that difference. That's what you're working with. So if you see paired T procedure, realize that it's the exact same test. You're just using mean differences um, to calculate that. Like we said, it's a matched pairs in an experiment called a matched pairs. And this paired data has the ability to increase the power of a test. Okay? Um, because it accounts for source variability, because you're using the same individual, and so you decrease that source variability there, that can increase the power of your test. So by decreasing the source variability, you can increase the power in the test. Okay, let's look at an experiment using um, this paired data. So we've got this experiment here with caffeine and um, whether the removal of caffeine, withdrawal of ca caffeine causes depression. Uh, so take a couple of minutes and pause and read the setup so that you know what's going on. Okay, so let's look at uh, part A of the problem. Why did researchers randomly assign the order in which subjects received the placebo and the caffeine? Well, what this does is it, once again, it makes sure that we anything that we find that's statistically significant is actually due to the treatment. So many statistically significant changes in depression are actually due to the treatment. If they don't know when they're getting caffeine and when they're not getting caffeine, they can't influence that or say they're, they're feeling one way because they feel like they should. So it just helps um, make, again, it just helps ensure that the results we get are actually due to the experiment. So part B has, a, has us carrying out a test to investigate the researcher's question. Okay, so this is gonna be our four step process like always. So step one, we've got our state. Where is it going? Okay, so for step one, we need to do the state part. And so our null hypothesis in this is that our mean difference so we're going to be using, uh, sorry, we're going to be using this column right here. We're going to be using the difference. So our mean difference here um, equals zero. So that's our null hypothesis, right? That our variable has no effect. That the removal of caffeine does not impact their depression score. So they should have the same score both times. Okay. Where our alternative hypothesis is just that the mean difference does not equal zero because they didn't specify one way or the other so that just that it does not equal zero so what we're doing here is that we want to test the hypotheses and we're going to put in all our context here so the hypotheses where uh, mean d okay, is the true difference and they define the difference is the true difference. And they state 
what is being subtracted from what? So placebo minus caffeine okay, in depression score, because that's what we're looking at, for, in, for subjects like these. So subjects that have truly been determined to be caffeine dependent. This is not a, um, they didn't take a sample of all caffeine users from all over the country. They didn't take a sample of others. Okay, and we've got an alpha here. I don't know why I do that. All right, and we have an alpha here of 0 0.05. So that's the state part of my problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear that out and let's go on, move on to the plan part. So in my plan part, Right, when I plan something, I need to go ahead and say what test I'm going to use. Right, so I'm going to plan, and I'm going to go ahead and just call it a paired T. Right, I'm going to use a paired T for the mean difference. Okay, I'm going to check my conditions in, because that's what I do during this part. Right, it random, it is in SRS. So our random condition is met. As for our 10% conditions, remember we do random in 10%, regardless of mean or proportion. We always do random in 10%. So there are probably more than 110 um, caffeine-dependent people like this. Also, this becomes irrelevant okay, if you're not sampling. Right, um, and we're not. We just pulled out these. We pulled these eleven people. We didn't sample from the entire population. Okay, um, and then we also because this is a mean. Now I do large sample. Where if it was a proportion, I would do large counts. Okay, but this is a mean, so I'm doing large sample. Unfortunately, I do not meet this condition. Okay, and so my sample size is less than thirty. So I need to check my graphs. So when I check my graphs here, I don't have any strong skew or outliers, so I can perform normal normal calculations. And again, remember you would um, you would need to draw one of these graphs. Okay, so moving on to the do part. So in the do part, okay, I'm going to actually show my um, show my calculations, show my work, uh, show my answer. Remember, I always show my test statistic. Okay, if you are following along in the book, you will see that they do this um, using technology. Either next class or the class after, we'll, go, we'll practice a lot with technology. I just wanted to be sure that you guys were really understanding what you were doing before we were pulling the calculator in, because I feel like that kind of bit us on the last test. So remember, it's from my sample. So my mean difference from my sample, which if I go ahead and I calculate the mean of this right here, I get 7.364 minus 0, because that's my parameter, over my standard deviation. So again, if I had typed all these in my calculator, I could have gotten the mean and the standard deviation. And then my sample size was 11. Okay, And so when I do that, I get 3.53. Remember, I always need to identify that test statistic. So when I put that into the calculator, Okay, I get um, I get a p-value that equals 0 0.0027. Okay, um, and then I need to make sure that I'm reporting that this is a t distribution with degrees of freedom. and those degrees of freedom equaling 10. I need to do the degrees of freedom, I need to say the test statistic, and I need to see the p-value. I can type these numbers here into the calculator, and then I can get all of these things. I can get my test statistic, I can get my p-value, and I can get my degrees of freedom. But I've got to remember to um, write all of those down and show all of that work. So now I need to move on to the conclude part. right? And so in my conclude part, so in my step four, my conclusion, okay, because the p-value 
0.0027 is less than our alpha of 0 0.05. We reject the null hypothesis. So you notice this statement has been the same. Right? We reject the null hypothesis, meaning we have convincing evidence. So we have convincing evidence that the true mean difference, oops, and again, placebo minus caffeine okay, is positive for subject, meaning that they're going to have one and it's going to be bigger. Positive, so meaning that the placebo, okay, so they're going to have a, it's going to be a positive number here, so placebo minus caffeine, so they have basically a higher depression score um, on the placebo, is positive for subjects like these. Remember this is only for, because um, this isn't from the entire population, so I can't say for all people. Okay, um, And so this would be an example of a matched pairs experiment because one person got both treatments, got a placebo as well as the depression, and so then I can compare those two values. Okay, I can, um, because we did random assignment of the placebo and the caffeine, and they didn't get, it wasn't known that like everybody got the caffeine on these two days and everybody got a, the placebo on these two days. Because we did the random assignment of pills, we can infer about cause and effect. We can infer that it was the placebo pills that caused the higher rate of depression or the lack of caffeine that caused a higher rate of depression. All right, let's look at some factors that will go into determining our sample size. What if we didn't know, we, you know, we have a hypothesis that we want to test we have an idea of how we're going to test it, but we want to know how big of a sample size that we really need. Some things that we would need to keep in mind is with our significance level. Okay? If I decrease my significance level, then I'm going to need to increase my sample size. Okay? Remember, my significance level really is how much of a risk of a type 1 error are we, am I okay with. If there would be serious consequences of a type 1 error, then I want a smaller significance level, which means I want a bigger sample size. If there aren't serious consequences of a type 1 error, then maybe I'm okay with an alpha of 0 0.05 or an alpha of 0 0.1, and my sample size doesn't have to be quite, quite as big. Remember, when I increase my significance, when I'm okay with a little bit more, with a little bit higher risk of having a, a type 1 error occur, so when I increase that significance level, I decrease my type 2 error probability, and when I decrease my type 2 error probability, I increase the power. Okay, so that may be something we want to keep in mind. So when you increase the alpha, right, I decrease my type 2 probability error, right, which means that I increase the power of the test. So I, that is things I would want, maybe want to keep in mind when I'm trying to determine what sample size might be good. Okay, as I'm determining my significance level, that's going to affect my sample size. The other thing I would need to think about possibly is my effect size, okay? And so my effect size is basically how big is my difference between my null parameter value and my actual parameter value that's important to detect. You know, does it, if we go back to those potatoes, if they're 9% of the potatoes have blemishes, you know, is that really that important? Okay, so how large of a difference between the null parameter value and my actual parameter value, is it important for me to detect? And if it's important for me to de detect a small change, okay, you know, maybe it's a, a medicine testing or something, and so it's important for me to detect a small change, then I need a bigger sample size. Because that means, right, coming back up here, that means I would have decreased my alpha because I don't want a potential type 1 error, and so I, again, need that bigger sample size. Okay, power can also come into play with our sample size, right? What chance do we want our, um, our, our increase? What chance do we want our sample study to have to detect a difference um, of the size we think is important? Basically, how good do you want your test to be? You've decided this effect size up here, 
Okay, and so you know how much of a difference that you think is going to be important. So basically, how good is your test going to be, right? And if I want to increase power, then I need to increase my sample size. So let's look at kind of the planning of this study here. This is a study about bone health. Okay, so can a six-month exercise program increase the total body bone mineral content of young women? A team of researchers is planning a study to examine this question. The researchers would like to perform a test of... Um, null hypothesis of no difference, right, with an alternative hypothesis of a positive difference or greater than zero difference. So where uh, mu is the true mean percent change in um, total body bone mineral content due to the exercise program, and to decide how many subjects they would include in their study, they're going to start thinking about those three things we just discussed. They're going to start thinking about significance level. Okay, so is a 0 0.05 significance level um, a good enough, right? Because remember, we're talking about our ability to, um, our risk of a type 1 error. So is that good enough protection against declaring that the exercise program increases my bone miner mineral content when it really doesn't? Okay, basically, are they going to promote this exercise program as the fact that it's going to do um, help increase your bone mineral content, and it really doesn't, and so then people get upset, Okay. And so then they'd have to decide on the effect size. A mean increase in our total body bone mineral content of 1%, is that is, they're considering that important to detect. Well, remember we said that a, a small effect size change okay, it needs a bigger sample size. Okay. And for the third one, with the power, the researchers want probability of at least 0.9 that a test... That, that a test, oh, draw, that a test at the chosen significance level will reject the null hypothesis when the truth is, um, when the truth is mu equals 1. So they want a power, basically, of 0.9, okay? Um, and so it's a pretty good size power, and so again, to increase our power, we have to increase our sample size. So they would need a pretty large sample size for this particular uh, test and we'll look some at this in class. We'll kind of play with this a little bit. Okay, so let's look at this example here. This example is not focused on sample size, but it's focused on just because it's statistically significant, does it actually mean that it's important? Okay, so in this study, they're testing a new antibacterial cream on a small cut. Okay, they know from previous research with no medication that the mean healing time is. 7.6 days, and that's for the scab to fall off. And the claim that they're testing here is that this new antibacterial cream is going to speed up healing. They're going to use an alpha of 0 0.05, okay? And so what they did is they cut a random sample of 250 college students and apply formulation NS to the wounds. The mean healing time for these subjects was 7.5 days, and the standard deviation was 0.9 days. So they're testing the claim about the mean, the mean healing time in the population being less okay, than the current 7.6 days. So when they examine the data, they don't have outliers, they don't have a strong skew, so they can do a sample t-test. Well, they carry out the sample t-test, and they discover their uh, t is equal to negative 1.76, their p-value is 0 0.04, and their degrees of freedom are 249. Well, in, after performing this t-test, 0.04, my p-value, is less than the 0.05 that was my significance level. So officially here, I'm going to reject the null. So I reject the null hypothesis. They have convincing evidence that formulation NS reduces the average healing time. However, if you look at it, right, the average healing time of the formula NS was 7.5. So basically, the wound healed, healed one-tenth of a day sooner. Yes, that's statistically significant, but is it really important? Does that, are you going to, you know, let's say this was a new antibacterial cream that costs $5 more because it, quote-unquote, heals your wound faster, but it's a tenth of a day faster. Okay, are you going to spend five more dollars for that? You know, I mean, it's not really important that it can do that. Okay, so let's look at one more thing here with this. Um, as we're going through these, all these examples and, and analyzing all this stuff, okay, keep in mind that you need to be sure that your study 
is actually designed for your particular hypothesis. Don't go searching for patterns and make the data fit what you want it to say. Okay? So make sure that the study is designed for the particular hypothesis that you're trying to test. Okay? So looking at this example right here, okay, we've, um, might the radiation from cell phones be harmful to users? Many studies have found little or no connection between using cell phones and various illnesses. And here's a part of a news account of one study. A hospital study that compared brain cancer patients and a similar group without brain cancer found no statistically significant difference between brain cancer rates for the two groups. But when 20 distinct types of brain cancer were considered separately, a significant difference in brain cancer rates was found for one rare type. Puzzling, however, this risk appeared to decrease rather than increase with greater mobile phone use. Okay, let's think about this for a second. So suppose that the 20 null hypotheses for these 20 significance tests are all true. Okay, so that would be that in our null hypothesis for this, right, would be that cell phones um, and brain cancer have no difference. There's no link, no link between the different amounts of cell phone use and different and brain cancer. Okay, so each test has a 5% chance of being significant at the 5% level. I ran 20 tests. Right? and I have a 5% significance level. So each test has a 5% chance of being significant at the 5% level. Okay? That's, what my, that's what that means. So only 5% of the time, just by chance, when the null hypothesis is true, am I going to get these uh, results. So we would expect about 1 out of 20 tests to give a significant result just by chance. Okay? So to give an increased brain rans cancer risk just by chance. Running one test and reaching your alpha level is reasonably good evidence that you found something. Running 20 tests and reaching that level once is not. Okay. Well, let's get an easier example than this and try to make this make a little bit more sense. Let's look at this. Okay. You know I like my cartoons. Okay. So let's follow this cartoon for a second here. Okay. So the girl comes in. Jelly beans cause acne. Scientists investigate, but we're playing Minecraft. Fine. Okay, so they investigate all the jelly beans, and they find no link between jelly beans and acne. Okay, and so they say that's it. Okay, then she says, well, I hear a certain color causes it. Okay, well, they test the purple ones. They test the brown ones. The brown ones, the pink ones, the blue ones, the teal ones, the salmon-colored ones, the red jelly beans, the turquoise jelly beans, the magenta jelly beans, the yellow jelly beans. Okay, are you following me? Are you following along here? And it continues, and they tested the gray jelly beans, okay, and the tan, and the cyan, and the green jelly beans, and they found a link between the green jelly beans. The p value was less than 0.5. But then in the mauve ones, there wasn't, and the orange ones, there wasn't. The peach, the black, the lilac, the beige. I've lost count of how many they tested. Okay. They tested all the jelly beans, and they didn't find and um, they didn't find a link. Then they tested each color individually, and out of like twenty tests that they just did, okay, they found one that was significant. Well, that would be expected. However, look how that got twisted. Green jelly beans linked to acne. Ninety-five percent confidence. Okay. They were search. She was searching for significance. Okay, and so we will need to make sure that we don't do that. Okay, all right, so we'll be practicing with all this stuff in class, okay, as we wrap this chapter up.